Good morning again. Okay, let's get this started. You excited to be here? Yes. All right, very good. Uh, before I start my talk, I want to start off with some fun, okay? So, I want to show you guys the latest toy that we have back in the office. So if you can see right here, this is a flying drone that's remote controlled. Uh, this, is, uh, this is actually Karen's drone that's flying. I'm filming this from my drone. So we have two drones actually flying in the office right there. Uh, there's Karen right there at the edge. And we're trying to do the thing where we're, we're practicing flying. So she's going to fly around the room, and I'm going to fly so my camera points at her all the time. We're lost in the lights. There we go. It's coming out there. I tell you, this is great fun. It's, it's really weird to see people walking through our hallways at the office and looking up and seeing what's going on with us. But uh, so far, everybody's been very positive. No one's uh, tried to get us kicked out because we're flying drones. But this is, this, is, this is awesome stuff, and we just have great fun. I'm not going to make you watch the entire video. I'm going to skip ahead here, and I'll show you what happens when your drone runs out of batteries. So there, yeah, about right here, maybe. Okay, so I'm, I'm filming, and uh, going around, all of a sudden I get a little bit wobbly with my drone, and there we go, okay. <laughs> Lesson, watch the battery meter when you're flying. Okay, so that's the fun part. We'll have more fun too, but I thought we'd just kind of start off with that. Hi, I'm Jim Weirich, I'm with Neo, um, and I'm here to talk about why you should be using Ruby. Now, I think, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to convince you that Ruby is a cool language to use, and that you should be using it, and, and if you're not already, how many people are here using Ruby already? Okay, quite a number. How many people here are curious about Ruby and aren't using it yet? Okay, quite a number of you. You are the guys I want to talk to. I want to tell you about Ruby and get you excited about maybe using it. Now, there's a downside to doing talks like this, and I think us as programmers fall into this trap a lot. There's features versus benefits. And when I talk about features, if I talk about Ruby, I'd love to tell you about the blocks in Ruby, how we can use anonymous blocks, do all kinds of wonderful things. I can talk about the strong... OO messaging in Ruby and how great that is. I can tell you that Ruby is a dynamic language. I can tell you about the testing culture that comes along with the community of Ruby. But these are all features of the language. What you really want to hear are what are the benefits to you for using Ruby. So I'm not going to talk a lot about the features of Ruby. Instead, I'm going to tell some stories. So maybe a better name for this talk instead of why aren't you using Ruby is why I use Ruby. So we're going to go from there. I'm going to tell you five stories about some Ruby code that I've written in the past that I get excited about and I really love. And the first story is about me switching to Ruby in the first place. How many people, rec how many people recognize this code? What language? Perl? Yes, Perl. So I was, I was using Perl at the time. This would have been the year 2000, probably in the spring. I've been using Perl for about three years to do a lot of scripting. Uh, I was a C++ programmer at the time, just learning Java uh, during this time period. And I used Perl to write a lot of the scripts that I used to manage my process, to generate header files, to find things in files, to sort things out, just all the tools that every programmer uses to get things done, I was writing my stuff in Perl. Now, Perl is a wonderful language to get things done quickly in, and I really, really loved it for that, but there's a big downside to using Perl. And I found that as my programs grew larger and larger, the Perl code became harder and harder to manage. As long as you need a list of items in Perl, that's awesome, it works great. But as soon as you need a list of a list, Things get a little strange in Perl. In fact, I would like to point out that in the Perl tutorial page, there's a separate document just talking about how to write a list of a list. And it is called Perl LOL. Not saying anything, but, okay? 
So I was using Perl, and I was really, really, really looking for something better. So I surveyed the landscape. And in the year 2000, there wasn't much else out there. But I stumbled along this other language called Python. But good, Python looks like it's exactly what I need. It's object-oriented, which is something I really, really liked. And if you ever try to do object orientation in Perl, oh, heaven help you. Um, it was a scripting language, and it was freely available. It fit all the criteria I needed. So I grabbed Python, and I started using it. The immediate downside I found is that where I could write stuff very, very, very quickly in Perl, to do it in Python required me to go back to the documentation and read. Well, how do I read a file? How do I do this? How do I do that? And every single thing I needed to do, I had to look up and learn. And so the learning curve moving from Perl to Python was rather steep for me. In fact, it was steep enough, I tried three separate times to learn Python and gave up two times. The third time, I was determined, I am going to learn this language or else. So I sat down and I started doing stuff with it. And I was reading the documentation and I was, I was really getting you know, into Python and I was really going to learn it. And then I was reading a mailing list. Um, I think it was the extreme programming mailing list because so, XP was really big in the year 2000. That was kind of when it was kicking off. And I was reading that mailing list and there was an email on that list from this fella, Dave Thomas, who wrote the Pickaxe book. But at the time, the only book he had written was Pragmatic Programmer, which I had just finished reading. Have you read this book? Awesome book. If you have not read this book yet, please go out and pick it up. It is full of really great pragmatic advice for developers. I really highly recommend it. So I said, oh look, here's an email from Dave Thomas, and I really respect him because of the book he wrote here. And in the email he said, hey guys, I discovered this little language called Ruby. It's kind of cool. You might like it. That's all he said. I thought, well, if Dave Thomas likes Ruby, I'm going to check it out. So I downloaded Ruby, and I booted it up, booted it up, I started it up, and I started taking a look at it, and in two days, I totally switched from Perl to Ruby. After two days, I wrote no more new code in Perl after that point. I, the switch over was so easy for me. Every time I got to a place where I said, I need to do something, I would think about, well, let's see, Perl does it like this. If I would take that and do it in an OO way, I would do it like this, and bam, it worked. So Ruby really matched, matched my expectations of the language. It was an awesome experience, and I loved Ruby ever since that. So I've been using Ruby now hmm, 13 years, getting really close to 13 years now. So um, awesome, awesome, uh, awesome language. So let's summarize this story. Uh, Ruby has what we call the principle of least surprise. Things in there, if you know the language and kind of knows, know where it's going, the things in it tend to be unsurprising. You think, hmm, how would I do this? And doggone it, it seems to work. It, it, it has great data abstraction. Where Perl had trouble managing lists of lists, Ruby could easily handle lists of anything. And it was just objects, and everything was uniformly accessed through through message passing, and it was strongly, strongly OO. In fact, it's probably the most OO language out there in the same class as Smalltalk. So uh, really strong OO ability and easy to learn. I found it quite easy to pick up and go with it. I teach Rails programming now to people new to Rails, and most of the people in the class are also new to Ruby. We teach them Rails and Ruby in a three-day course, and they come out of that with a pretty good foundation on how to do programming in Rails, even though that might be the first time they've seen Ruby. Ruby is not a hard language to pick up. So, second story. This is a true story. The other one was true, too, but I just want to emphasize that this one in particular is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent, guilty, those involved. I was working at a large financial company at the time, and this is soon after I've uh, uh, discovered Ruby. And uh, I was using Ruby a lot, again, for my tooling, for the stuff I do every day. I wrote Ruby scripts to analyze the database. I wrote Ruby scripts to go into the database and pull out data 
and show it to me in a form so I could easily figure out what was going on in the database. I wrote Ruby scripts to talk to their event manager so I could receive events and publish events on their event manager. So everything in the environment that we worked with, I had Ruby scripts to communicate with that and make it easier as my job as a programmer to do work in that environment. Now this particular uh, part of the company dealt with incoming mail. If you send any kind of mail to this big multinational financial corporation, it all came through this one room in Hebron, Kentucky. And they would open up the mail and they would scan it into a scanner and digitize it. And that scanner, that data would go into a program that would read it and it would generate an event for every item that was scanned. That event was published and picked up by the next program in the pipeline. So at this point, it's been scanned, it's a form, and it's got image data attached to this event. Actually, the image was stored in the database, but a reference to the image was put into the event. Then it would run through a barcode reader that would look at the image and look for barcodes and find data encoded on the form in barcodes and add that to the event and publish it again. Well, this new event then went to the um, checkbox analyzer, and it would look for checkboxes on the form and see if this checkbox was checked or if this checkbox was not checked. And then it would add information about checkboxes to the event, and it would publish it again. And then it would go on in the pipeline. There were stages in this pipeline that looked for character information, did handwriting analysis, and there was manual verification steps and things, but it kept publishing these events on the pipeline till eventually it got to the point where it says, okay, we've collected all the data for this form. I'm going to publish this data out to the pension division or to the stock options division or to some other division, and it was a whole workflow type of thing. Well, for many years, how they handled fax data was they would get a fax, they would print out the fax, and they would scan it. It, that actually worked, and surprisingly, but it seemed to be rather inefficient, and scanning a, you know, a fax is already scanned, and scanning that is just leads to all kind of dirty images. So they thought they could get better results by feeding the scanned fax data directly into the feed. So the fax data would come into its own process, it would publish an event, and then it would enter the pipeline just like anything else. So paper, email, or paper mail was scanned, fax data was scanned and sent in as well. So that's the way that worked. I was sitting at my desk one day, working hard on, you know, kind of heads down on working on whatever I needed to work on. This was the days before pair programming got popular, so I had my own cubicle right there. And I was kind of heads down, and I noticed that people were kind of wandering around uh, outside my cubicle and kind of running back and forth, and, and the noise level seemed to be a bit, little bit louder, and I wondered, hmm, something's going on today, and I don't know what that might be but I'm working here. And finally, my manager comes into my cubicle with another developer and he says, uh, uh, Jim, you know, you know Ruby, don't you? I said, uh, yeah, because I've been kind of evangelizing Ruby to the rest of the group. I was the main user of it, but there were several other people who saw some of the advantage of Ruby and were using it as well. And they said, well, this is what happened. The part of our process that takes in faxes and publishes the event somehow was dropping events. I no longer recall the exact technical reason for this failure. Maybe the disk was full, or maybe there was an exception being thrown. I don't remember. But these faxes were being dropped. Now, you know, if I lose a fax, you know, what, how do I use fax? I fax an order to a restaurant. If I lose my fax, I, I don't get my meal that day. Um, that's not the case with this company. Those orders coming in, might be changes to pension plans or changes to stocks or, you know, buy this stock, sell that stock. And if they don't take action on that order within a certain number of hours, they are liable for the difference in price from the point that they, the fax was sent and the point they actually made the trade. This is potentially millions of dollars of data that was falling out of the fax machine and onto the floor. This was an emergency. So they said, Jim, you know Ruby, can you help us? Now it turns out that the fax program wrote a pretty complete log of everything it did. 
And the log was still being written. It was saying, oh, exception thrown. We're not delivering the message. But every single fax element was, was recorded in the log along with the database ID of the image associated with that fax. So what I had to do was write a Ruby script that would read the log, would reconstruct the event based upon details in the log, pull the database ID out and put it in an event, and republish that event into the system. So essentially, I was writing a vacuum sweeper that would sweep up all the, the broken faxes laying on the floor and put them in. So this is how I saved the company millions of dollars using Ruby. Ruby Hero. I asked for a fraction of that million to be included in my bonus, and they just laughed. I don't, I don't get that. And actually, truthfully, it was a team effort. I was doing the log recovery. Someone else was doing some event stuff. Uh, there were about five or six people all working on this problem. The log recovery piece was just a small portion of that, but together by using Ruby, and they, and they knew that Ruby could handle the job. They knew they could not write this stuff in Java quick enough, you know, in the half hour that we needed to get this done. So here, Ruby handles an emergency. It's really rapid to get a quick solution up. It took me about half an hour to figure out how to parse the log file and generate those events, and we saved lots and lots of money with that. All right. Next story. I love this picture. This is actually at the Breedlove Guitar Factory in Bend, Oregon. And the gal here is actually working on the fretboard of a guitar. She's laying in the grooves and putting in the frets for a guitar that will be made there. I have a Breedlove guitar, so when I took the tour of the factory, I just took all kinds of pictures. I love, I love this stuff. But what I want to concentrate on is that we, as developers, love to make things, love to build things. I was working on a project with a friend of mine. We were actually pairing. And uh, we were working on getting a build script up and running and working. And we were doing, and we were, it was for Java, but we were old hat developers back in those days. We, uh, this ant thing was kind of newfangled for us. So we were still using make at the time. And we were trying to do make, trying to get make to do something that was just a little bit too dynamic for make. We were shelling out to awk and scripting stuff and doing all kinds of weird things. I think I looked like this by the time I was done. I turned around to Ryan. I said, Ryan, wouldn't it be great if make were written in Ruby? And Ryan says, Jim, that's an awesome idea. I have no idea what you mean. So I turned around to the whiteboard and I scribbled on the whiteboard something that looked approximately like this. I said, Ryan, you would, you would have a task command. And this task command takes a, a name of some kind of task you want to perform. And then you just give it a block of stuff you wish to execute when this task is performed. And somehow you would manage dependencies and do that. And, and you would just use this like you use make. But it'd be all written in Ruby. It'd be totally dynamic. This problem that we're trying to solve would be trivial to do in Ruby. And he says, that's brilliant. And we talked about it for another five minutes, but then we realized, you know, if we really, really wanted to do this, what would we have to do? Well, we would have to reproduce the entire functionality of make in Ruby just so we can get it a little bit more dynamic. And we laughed at that idea. That's silly. No one would ever, ever want to do that. Only an idiot. <laughs> so Ryan went back to his desk, and he left me sitting there thinking. And I began to think, well, gosh, how hard could it really be? I mean, if I did a really trivial implementation of make in Ruby, what would I have to do? Here, imagine you have this set up. Let's set up a sample make-like problem. You have a task called make mac and cheese. And in order to make mac and cheese, you need to boil water, you need to buy cheese, and you need to buy the pasta for the macaroni. Before you can buy either pasta or macaroni, you have to go to the store, and these tasks have to be, all be performed in the proper order 
because you don't want to start boiling the water before you go to the store. That would be silly. So you need to have some kind of dependency structure between these tasks, and you be, need to be able to say, hey, go and do this. So you might create a structure that looks like this. Declare a task, give it a list of dependencies, and these dependencies are exactly the dependencies I've drawn out here with the green arrows. Make mac and cheese, boil water, buy pasta, buy cheese, go to store, five different tasks with all their dependencies declared. And if you're familiar with rake, this is very, very, very similar to what rake looks like today. Just a few syntactical differences just to make it easy. Because what we're going to do now is we're going to write rake. You think I'm joking. <laughs> so here, there is our task file. I have it all ready to go. So there's all our tasks. Let's open up the micro rake file, and you can see it's empty. And what I want to be able to do is be able to say Ruby micro rake and give it the Mac, oh no, excuse me, make Mac and cheese command and run that and it'll run all the tasks. Now you see it does nothing here because our micro rake file is empty. So let's see what we need to write to make this to work. Um, I'm going to start with the last thing we do and work backwards in the file. So we need to be able to grab this command name right here, this make mac and cheese from the command line and try to invoke a task to fix that. So I'm going to say argv each do for each argument in our argument list, um, we need to find the task. So let's assume we have a global hash called tasks. We look up the task in there, we invoke the task, and then we end. So there, that's, that's the end of our program. So what becomes before that? Well, we need, a, I said I had a global task uh, hash here. So let's create that and let's define a task method it takes a name, a, uh, thank you, Ian. We're just going to turn off Wi-Fi here. <laughs> that is way too tempting for people. Uh, it takes a name, it takes dependencies, and it takes a block. And in there, we're going to create a task object new and pass it the name, the dependencies, and the block into that. That'll create a task object. Now I need to save it somewhere. So let's take our tasks hash and save it by its name, just like that. What? What? I wrote you twice. Oh, 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 thank you. This is why we pair. This is like super pairing or something. <laughs> okay, so let's create our task thing here. And I'll need a constructor that takes the name, the dependencies, and the action block and just stores them off. I'm going to want to have a method called um, uh, execute. And execute is very simple. It just takes the action and calls it. Because action is just a block and it's, going to, it's an anonymous function. We're just going to call it like that. And now I need to write invoke. Evoke's a little more tricky. Let's see. A, a task should never execute twice. So if it's already run, let's, you know, you invoke it, it's already run, we're done. We have to, we can return immediately. So we return if Already, eh. there we go, already run. Um, so if we get this far, that means it hasn't run yet. We have to make sure all our dependencies are invoked. So depths each do dep. And I would like to say dep invoke, but that's not quite right because dep is, uh, the dependencies are names. So I have to look them up first. So I have to look them up in the tasks hash like that. Fortunately, I have that available. And after all my dependencies are invoked, I can go ahead and just execute our current task and mark it as already run. Cool. 
We're almost done. The only thing we need to do is right here, we just, oops, need to require the tasks file, like that. 28 lines of code. Let's see how close I got. All right. I sat down at my desk and I thought about this. I said, this is easy, actually. I need a list of dependencies. I need to iterate through them. I need to evoke them recursively. And that's really all there is. So I took about half an hour. I did this in about three minutes. It took me about half an hour the first time I did this. And I sat down and I emailed it to Ryan. And then I ran over to Ryan's desk. I said, check your email, check your email, check your email. <laughs> and he pulled it up and there it was. In, in this, I, think it was I think I had about 50 lines in my first implementation. There it was in 50 lines, all of you know, the basic core logic of Rake right there. And, and Ryan glowed over it, and he, we were, oh, this is really cool. And then I go, but yeah, but uh, it's not really make, because make will check timestamps on the files and only rebuild files if they're out of date with respect to their dependencies. And this was more like Ant, which just does tasks uh, regularly. And I thought, yeah, that file, that file testing thing, that'd be hard. No one would ever do that. I went back to my desk, and about 20 minutes later, I subclass task as a file task, added a, added a check in there to see if it was out of date uh, with, response, with respect to its dependencies, and I had a file task thing in there. So within eh, under an hour's worth of coding, I had the first version of Rake out there and running. Now, of course, there's a lot more in Rake today. There's file lists, there's, um, the, there's all the shell commands that work, and there's a lot of little things that help you get Rake-like stuff done. But this is the core, and this is it. And it's all in 28 lines of code right there. A friend of mine who was, uh, started using Ruby because of my great enthusiasm for it, he said, yeah, Jim, I, was, I tried to solve a problem in Ruby the other day, and I just started writing code, and I was done before I realized it. <laughs> That's kind of how it works. Ruby is so good at expressing what you as a programmer want to express. It really matches the way I think very closely. Okay, whoops. Let's skip all. I got this, the code in there too. So, 28 lines of code, about half an hour of effort. You got the basic core engine in there, and what we didn't do was file task. But this was awesome. This just goes to show that Ruby is really good at expressing and capturing ideas very quickly. Next story. I'm going to have to speed up just a little bit. Um, beautiful testing, or as I like to call this section, designed by conference. I was at the Ruby Hoedown in 2009. Do you guys know what a hoedown is? Do you have hoedowns here in Uruguay? Yeah, it's kind of a uh, um, southern thing in America, right? It's kind of a party, it's a dance, it's a kind of a you know, good time party. Well, the Ruby Hoedown was where we get together and talk about Ruby. And it's a, it's a lightweight conference. It was free. It's close to where I live in, in, uh, in Ohio. And so a lot of us from Edge Case, we were Edge Case at the time, we would all pile in about two or three vehicles and we'd drive down to Nashville, Tennessee, where the hoedown was being held and we all attend a conference. And this is almost kind of like a little mini vacation for us. Uh, here you can see we're all gathered. This is at one of the tables there at the hotel. It looks like we're in Florida because there's palm trees. This is actually indoors um, in the hotel. It's a huge, huge, monstrous hotel. Um, but during the conference, we sat around tables much like this at the back room of the conference area, and we kind of talked amongst each other because, you know, we were kind of laid back. None of us were presenting that year. We were just enjoying the conference. And someone got up to give a talk on cucumber. How many people use cucumber here? Anybody? Phew. I, I, I have a love-hate relationship with cucumber, but the thing I love about it is the fact it lays out your testing as given, when, and then. And I really, really, really like that way of specifying my tests as these are the things that are given. When I do this code, then I expect this thing to happen. 
And I would lay out my tests in this format anyways, kind of informally, but I was really looking for a more formal way of specifying given, when, then in my tests. So I was sitting in the back room, and I was thinking of all this, and I grabbed a, a notepad, and I started writing on the notepad. Notice how so, so many ideas just kind of start as scribbling down on a piece of paper. And I said, I started pushing this paper around the table where we were all sitting. And I said, does this make sense to you? If, I, if you saw a test in this format, would you understand what's going on? And the feedback I got was more or less positive. Everybody felt that by looking at something like this, you could kind of tell what was going on. And even knowing nothing about the given when then framework, you could figure out what was going on. So I, I kind of got positive feedback on this, except from my boss. Because at that time, the test unit versus mini test versus R spec versus something else flame wars were still going strong. And there were so many testing frameworks for Ruby, Joe really didn't think we needed yet another one. And I assured him, no, Joe, I am not going to actually write this. I'm just, I'm just brainstorming on ideas. I lied. So I wrote uh, a library called Given that was based on test unit. And this is um, an example from the GitHub page. It's still out there. Don't go and use it. Um, I, there's something better than this. But this is my first pass at this. And there's a couple things I'd like to point out about this code. First of all, I added the idea of an invariant. An invariant is something that is always, always, always true, no matter what you do to this object. In this case, I'm saying if you've got a stack object, it is always true that the uh, stack depth is going to be non-negative. It's always true that if the stack depth is zero, then empty will be true. And if empty is false, then the stack depth will be something other than zero. And these things that are always true about a stack. And then I divided up the rest of the test into this. I said, given an empty stack, and so given this method. So I had initialization or setup procedures by name. You had to name the setup procedures in the given statement, and then you went through several tests. So this is actually three tests right here. An empty stack, an empty stack you expect the stack to be zero. Uh, when you push an item, you expect the stack, to, the depth to be one and the top to be that item. And when you pop it, you should get some kind of failure error. Now this was okay. I kind of liked it, but I was a little uncomfortable with it. A couple things I didn't like. I didn't like this fails with thing. This was just pure ugly. This exception thing popped up by magic, and uh, that was, yeah, felt weird to me. I didn't like the fact I had to say expect, expect, expect. Um, although I was doing this in test unit, I didn't have the dot should that uh, RSpec uses. I might have used that here, but I didn't like doing that a whole lot. So, so it was okay, but just not quite what I wanted. wanted. The next year I was at another conference. This was Ruby Nation. This takes place in, the, um, in Washington, D.C., the capital of the U.S. there. And uh, at this conference, John Larkowski was giving a talk on pure RSpec. Now, at the time, I was a test unit guy. I used test unit to write all my tests. And RSpec was okay, but I didn't use it that much. But he gave this talk, RSpec, pure RSpec. In fact, if you want to go see his talk, he's, his slides are right there at that URL. Um, and at one point, he got to this slide right here. And he says, our spec has this thing called let. If you say let this name be this block, let is a lazy initializer. When you, call, when you reference that name the first time in a test, it goes out and executes that block and assigns the value of the block as the value for that name. So here, blog post gets assigned a new blog post every time it, uh, it gets referenced, or the first time it's referenced in a test. And if you break this down, it's essentially this code. That let statement is writing a lazy initializer method that does this. Well, that was kind of cool. And I realized also that this really interacts well with RSpec's block nature. You have nested describe and context blocks in RSpec, and this essentially turns into this, where you have a class here, the let turns into a method, the example is here, 
And so this actually inherits from the outer example, so this version overrides that version, so you can internally override decisions you made outside. And that works really, really nicely with the uh, structure of RSpec. So I rewrote RSpec, I rewrote Given to use RSpec, and it turned out to be something like this. And I really, really like the way this, this reads here. We'll go through this fairly quickly. Um, so given a stack, stack new, given the initial contents of the stack, and it defaults to being empty, the initial contents, and then we load up the stack with the initial contents here and this given. So here, these givens are essentially less. This given here is essentially a before. I kept invariant, and notice there is no longer an expect or a should on that. This returns either true or false, and our spec given is able to determine what the error is um, if, it, if it fails. It gives you a nice error message, we'll see in a second. Um, here is an empty stack with initial contents that it's dapped as this. When you push, these things are true. When you pop, it should have failed, so this is much like the test we saw before. Here's a stack with several items, so we override the initial contents to be this. The original depth we record, and so after you, you know, you do some pushing, you do some popping, and these are the things that are true once that's done. This reads beautifully. This reads like a specification. This, I love this, I love this, and just about everyone I've showed this to says, yeah, this is kind of cool. They really, really, really like it for writing their, their specs. Um, the nice thing is, suppose we change this to be a two, so this fails. If you do that, you get this kind of error message, where it tells you we expected one to equal zero, and then it breaks down the, the expression that failed. And it gives you the stack depth is one, the stack object is this, the original depth minus two is zero, the original depth itself is two. So it breaks down each sub-expression in the thing that failed. and gives you all the details you need to debug why that thing is failing. So beautiful output from a beautiful testing framework. So, summary. Sometimes ideas mature slowly. There's synergy in things like the nested nature and the given one then of our spec, and you get expressive readable tests out of this. I'm almost out of time, but we're gonna go real fast. Flying robots is our last story. This ties into the video I put at the front so this is the AR drone that you saw flying. This is in the outdoor mode where it doesn't have the um, bumpers on it. Um, it has cameras, it has all kinds of sensors that allow it to do interesting things. And the best part of it is that it talks to you over Wi-Fi and the entire API is open. And you can see exactly what's going on. And there's a developer guides and PDFs on the entire API. So it looks something like this. There's a command stream that goes to the drone, it sends back navigation data and video data. Navigation data looks something like this. You send it text commands, so it's trivial to write this in Ruby. You have to send it a sequence number, you send it things like takeoff flags and emergency landing flags. You give it information like roll and pitch and altitude and, and yaw. You send all that information to it. Uh, you can send it configuration commands like set your lights to be this or um, do some particular video targeting. And here's a program written in a library called Argus. It creates a drone object, starts, it takes off, turns right for five seconds, turns left for five seconds, then hovers and lands. Turn right for five seconds. Turn left for five seconds. hovers and lands. Here's another one. This will take off and go through a loop. Go left and right two times. Showing you the code here, just so you believe it's programmed. Hit the return, there's a five second delay. I run over to the other side of the office. This is me running. <laughs> right, left, right, left. Land, uh, hover, and land. The first time I tried programmatic control of, of moving sideways, I said, go forward, one. And it went vroom, right into a wall. <laughs> okay, maybe one's not the best. Let's do point two. 
So navigation coming back from the drone is a lot trickier, where the stuff going to the drone is just simple text commands. Coming back is actually binary data. It has a fixed length header that's about four, uh, I think it's four 32-bit integers that come back at the header. Then it's got variable length options. Navigation data and vision detection data are the two options that I'm interested in particular. And they're variable length. And they're packed and they look like this. This is actually from the structure of the C code from the API. Um, that means to decode this stuff, I've got to do weird things like unpack it with weird commands in the unpack command and then know exactly which array element references that particular data. And then I have to do like some floating point decodes on the floating point data that comes back. And it's just weird. So I don't want to do that. So I wrote some code that looks like this. This is Ruby code. That looks a lot like the C code. We're just missing, we added a semicolon at the beginning of the name and we removed the, the Added, yeah, added a colon at the beginning of the name, removed the semicolon, and it is now Ruby code. So I can take the header, paste it into my Ruby, do minor text editing on it, and now I have something that allows me to access that data. So this line says, unpack it with a capital V, and the name of that data position in the array is v, VBAT flying percentage, the uh, battery percentage left. This one says, unpack it with V, decode it with the decode float command, and then call that one theta. So I can do this with all the options there. Here's, I'm going to skip over this. This is not that important. But here's another program that says when this is a callback. And this is called whenever the drone sends me a binary data package. And it says, OK, go through the data options. And for each option, check to see if it is the nav option vision detection. So the drone tells me when it sees a particular target in its camera sights and tells me the position in the camera where that is. It's about 1,000 pixels wide, so if we're at 500, we're on target. If we're above 600, I want to turn right. If it's below 400, I want to turn left. So we blink the lights, we take off. And I'm going there, I am holding the outdoor hall, and that orange and yellow pattern is what the camera detects. <laughs> Too fast. There we go. Okay, move slow, it can find it. It's not real bright, okay, so there we go. And there we go. So it's turning and following the pattern. Um, we're doing some more stuff with this. We're not done with this. What I, what I want to do is be able to have it follow me. Put a hat with that pattern on it and walk down the hall and just have the drone follow me wherever it goes. Turns out that's a lot trickier than just having it turn and look at you. Uh, the first time I did it, I had a bug in my advance, you know, advance or backup logic, and it zeroed into the target and like just attacked me. <laughs> so we're going slow on that part. All right, so summary. This is real-time programming. I have to send that drone command, a command every 50 milliseconds or so just to, so it doesn't lose the data stream, otherwise it'll shut down and hover and land. Um, I'm using threads, although I want to switch around to use celluloid and an actor pattern in the near future. There is a library called R2 that allows you to talk to multiple robotic type devices, one of them being the drone, the other being um, like a, a, have you seen the Sphero robots, the round robots that are colored and just roll around? You can control those with the R2 library, so check that one out. This library I'm using to control the drone itself is called Argus. Um, yeah, so again, being able to write expressive code, I could take that C code, put it in my Ruby code, and exactly map to the exact data that was in that binary data. And doggone it, this stuff is fun. 
So, features and benefits. You saw some of the features, but the benefits of Ruby that I see, it's easy to learn. You can be up and running on Ruby really, really quickly. It's extremely expressive. It says what you want to say in your code. It's flexible. You can write it, you can handle C data structures with it. You can get to uh, a working prototype really, really fast with it. It's easy to change and dog on it. I think Ruby is fun. I'm out of time, but I'm Jim Warwick at Neil. Thank you. <laughs>